All right, guys, so this is the first video for the pharmacology. So we're going to try this, and this is kind of how I did it even when I taught it. Um, you know, most of this stuff, pretty much all of it, you know, I, I was at a point when I was studying for the step exams to where I had to search YouTube for someone who could explain it to me. So how I did it was I, I found like, you know, when I went through the NBME and the QBanks and stuff, if I didn't understand the concept, I'd go to YouTube and try to find someone who could explain it. Um, there were some people that could really draw really well. I think one of those guys was like Armando. Um, so I stole a lot of that stuff, uh, kind of incorporated it into some questions. And so I, I kind of worked backwards. Again, I used questions and then try to teach, teach from there. So, um, you know, I will have these things kind of on the website. These are the kind of the notes that I'm going to pretty much go by. But again, I had them kind of laminated uh, when I studied. But we'll make sure that eventually we'll get them up, get them up on the website so people can kind of download them in PDF and stuff like that. So they're, I'll make sure it's in the description when, when that's made available. So um, again, it's the first video in, pharma, in the uh, pharmacology. If you like it, let us know. Um, share it with a friend. You know, hit, hit subscribe and uh, let me know what you think. All right, guys. So here's the first question. It says a fourth year medical student is working in the emergency department and encounters a 24 year old male who is severely agitated due to suspected drug toxicity. The attending physician asks the student about their knowledge of pharmacokinetics. The attending physician asks the student which of the following would have the shortest T max. Now, <clears throat> in order to kind of answer this question, this is again, this is kind of the, ba the basics. We got to know a couple definitions here. First of all, pharmacokinetics, okay, pharmacokinetics, we know that is just the study of movement of drugs in the body, okay, it's how the drugs move um, in the body, okay, and what you got to know is absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, and I guess I should write this out to make it all nice and neat, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. How the, again, this is pharmacokinetics. So, and again, where this might start is you gotta know, you gotta know the basic system. So this is gonna be the GI or the gut, okay? That's one option. So if you take something orally, a pill, you know, it's gonna go to the gut. And then where is it gonna go? Well, and then it's going to eventually, it's going to go to the liver. And then from there, it's going to go to vein, okay? And then it's going to go to the heart. And then it's going to go, that's going to be the lung, okay? It's my version of the lung. And then it's going to go back to the heart, right? And then it's going to go out to the artery, <clears throat> and then it's going to go to the rest of the body, right? So if you took a pill, it would start way down here. So eventually, you know, if this is kind of our destination, you know, something that's after, you know, after the heart, when the heart pumps it out and it goes to the, you know, where it goes to the brain or some destination point, you know, the, the, the one that's going to take the longest is going to be the oral, the pill, right? Because it's got to go to the gut, liver, vein, heart, lung, da, 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 da. So... If you did, you know, an IV, then it would go into the vein. So it's it's a couple steps further down the, you know, further I guess up the line, um, you know, from that. And then if you did an anesthetic, anesthetic, you know, anesthesia, um, you would go right into uh, the lung. Okay, I put let me just label that one, two, and three, but. Again, for pharmacokinetics, which is absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion, you got to know the, base, the basics of, you know, things can start out in the gut, go to the liver, vein, heart, lung, um, back to the heart, and then artery, and then to its destination. It, it would take less time for the anesthetic to reach the destination than it would for the IV or the pill. So with that, you know, they come up with these, these charts, and this is just the general chart, where on the y-axis here, okay, the y-axis, we're gonna have drug concentration. And then on the, the x-axis here, you're gonna have time, okay? So when you take a drug, and right now we don't care which, which whether you take it oral, IV, or anesthetic, you know, it's gonna go in the system, then you rent, eventually reach a maximum point right here, and then it's gonna kinda of steadily decline. So when it reaches that maximal point right there, 
that's going to be called C max, right? It's the maximum concentration of the drug, you know, the highest point. And then when that occurs, the time when you reach C max is called T max, right? Maximum, maximum time where you get the maximum concentration. Now, as the drug leaves the body, right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of go downhill, and then once it reaches right there, you know, half of its maximum, okay, it went down and it's half of what it was, that would be, that would be called one half C max, or if we go over here, you know, that's going to be called um, half T max, right? So the difference, now here's the key point. The difference in time that it took to go from the concentration to half of its maximum, that is what is known as the drug's half-life, okay? That's what's known as the drug's half-life. So let's take this one step further before we answer this question. Let's take that same graph and now apply it to whether you took something by pill, something IV, or something an an anesthetic. And again, on the y-axis, we got the drug's concentration. Um, and, and on the x-axis, we got time. So if we took something and it goes in really fast, reaches pretty high levels pretty quickly, and then goes down, that's one example. And then we could have something that goes in the system pretty slowly and then reaches a maximum kind of down the line, but not nearly as much. And then we might have something that's more so in between, all right? So, out of these three lines, right, we got this one. Let me just make that a little bit darker. Which one do you think that is? Is that the pill? Is that the IV or the anesthetic? Because it goes in pretty quick. You get a very, uh, you know, very quickly, right, because there's time from zero to here is not very long, and you get a pretty high concentration. Well, that is obviously going to be the anesthetic, okay? Goes in real fast. It has a, so that an anesthetic has a, high C max, high concentration max, and a low T max. Now, the pill, right, if you took it orally, it goes in real slow and reaches, eventually reaches a maximum. But out of, all, but out of all three of those, you know, its C max is right here. It's going to be the lowest, and its T max is going to be the highest. So in, for an anesthetic, you know, C max is low, T max is going to be high, obviously compared to everything else. And then the IV is going to be somewhere kind of in between the two. But you got to know, you got to understand again, anesthetic goes in quick, low T max, and oral medication takes a long time. You don't, and you know, stuff gets lost when you start doing all the, um, when we talk about distribution and stuff like that, where things kind of settle and you get a lower C max. Okay. Now, the other points of all this is everything, you know, for the anesthetic, you know, everything that's under that curve, they call it area under the curve, and you might see that little acronym AUC, area under the curve throughout. Well, the area under the curve, no matter whether it's, uh, for all, all our purposes at this point, whether you take something uh, oral, anesthetic, or IV, the area under the curve is same regardless of the delivery. It doesn't matter which one it is, right? Okay. So, with all that being said, let's go back to the question. It says, for if, you know, a fourth-year medical student is working in the emergency department and encounters 24 hours of the attitude, blah, 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 blah. The attending physician asks the student about their knowledge of pharmacokinetics. The, attending asks, asks the, physician, the phys attending physician asks the student which of the following have the shortest T-max. The shortest T-max. The shortest time to get to a high concentration. Is it rectal delivery, inhaled anesthetic, IV delivery, intramuscular, oral, dissolvable oral tablet, okay? Well, we know the one that's going to have the longest Tmax is going to be oral, so he's out. And then when we compare these, intramuscular, IV, the one that we talked about is going to have the quickest or the shortest Tmax is going to be the inhaled anesthetic. And, of course, rectal would take a lot longer than that. So... You have to know the basics of, you know, the pharmacokinetics, and it begins with absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Okay? This one says, a series of experiments is performed to determine the mechanism of transportation across the membrane and accumulate in target cells. 
The rate of transport depends on the concentration of the drug. When the extracellular concentration exceeds 20 uh, nanomoles, I guess, I don't know, millimoles, uh, no further increase in the rate of uptake is observed. Rebaprazole sodium is an inhibitor of the sodium potassium ATPase and fails to inhibit transport. Which of the following is the most likely mechanism by which this agent enters the cell? Now, of course, I kind of retweaked this question. I saw, I've, I've seen this on one of those um, kind of old NBME, and I just kind of read it a little bit, but very important. Remember, NBME is where they, they kind of get the people that make the, the step exams get a lot of their stuff. For, I mean, it's, it's essentially the same level of questions. Like, this is a good one, okay? So, this goes back to, we got to figure out, we look at our answer choices. They're talking about this diffusion, acting transport. Okay, so that's confusing. So, they're talking about rate of transport uh, across a membrane. All right. Well, remember, on pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. They're talking absorption here. Now, let's just do, let's just do it on a, a different piece of paper here just to make it easier. Types of absorption. Types of absorption. We got passive. Okay. We got facilitated diffusion. We got active transport, and let's just think endocytosis, okay? Now, these are the four that are gonna, that are gonna get you through the step exams, okay? Passive transport, most common, okay? And, on, and what that is, is it's based on concentration gradient, so it goes from a high concentration gradient to a lower state. It just kind of flows on over, okay? And, okay, they always say if it's water-soluble, it needs a gradient, okay? And so water or, and then again, it's just passive. It's like it's just diffusion across, per se. Um, or if it's, um, Fat soluble can pass without a gradient. Okay, but again, passive. It's just going to flow from again a higher concentration to a lower, or it's just going to kind of it's going to diffuse and then it's going to kind of settle out until it's you know until it's balanced. Okay, no energy needed, right? It just kinda, it'll just kind of flow. It'll happen. It's simple. So the next one's facilitated diffusion. Again, it also goes from high to low concentration, okay? But the kicker to this one is with help of a carrier protein. Well, what does that look like? Well, means it has the same look to it, but it's got a carrier to help it, okay? Meaning something's gotta attach right here and then send it across, okay? It does go from high to low, but you need a carrier protein. That's why it's called facilitated diffusion. Okay, it's not passive, we're just gonna flow. It's facilitated means you gotta have a carrier protein. And again, both of these, they don't need ATP, okay? There's no ATP. Active transport, okay, active. Well, it looks like that, so you got this carrier thing here. Um, but to make it happen, to make the, the active transport happen, it's ATP dependent, energy dependent, okay? ATP, you know, it makes ADP and stuff like that. So active transport, ATP, energy dependent. And then the last one of these types of absorption is endocytosis, okay? And basically on that one, it comes in, it gets, you know, engulfed or, or absorbed material, it becomes, you know, internalized and becomes basically like a vesicle and you know vesicle forms and gets transferred over and so when you see the word like engulfment and due to due to its size you think endocytosis and this one's also atp dependent all right so that's just it passive facilitated diffusion active transport and endocytosis so now let's go back to the problem it says again a series of experiments is performed to determine the mechanism of transportation across the membrane and accumulate in target cells. The rate of transport depends on the concentration of the drug. When the extracellular concentrations exceed this point, 
no further increase in rate of uptake is observed. Re this rebeprazole rebe sodium is an inhibitor of the sodium ATPase and fails to inhibit transport. Which of the following is most likely mechanism? Hmm. So what they're saying is that we do have something that goes across. Okay, and we only got four of these things to look at, right? So it's either going to be passive, facilitated diffusion. It's going to uh, active transport or it's going to be endocytosis, right? Now, what do we know about these? Again, no ATP on that one, no ATP, and these have an ATP. So what do we have in this, in this question that would lead us to know about the ATP? Well, let's look at this. It says this inhibitor of the sodium ATPase, so when you take an inhibitor, nothing, it doesn't inhibit, you know, it, it doesn't inhibit anything. So that would lead me to believe that when you take this, it should inhibit the ATPase pump. But what they're saying is that when you do that, nothing happens. So does this mechanism of transport use ATP? And you're going to be like, no, it does not. Because if it did, then this thing would actually do something, but it doesn't. So we can eliminate the ones that use ATP based on that statement right there, okay? Since it doesn't, since it fails to inhibit anything, it means the thing ain't, it's not there. So now we're left with passive and facilitated diffusion. So what's the other thing that they tell us? When the extracellular concentrations exceed a certain point, no further increase is, um, is observed. So the difference between passive and facilitated was what? You know, they both, you know, pretty much have this gradient that goes from high concentration to low, but what did facilitated have? it actually had these things called carrier proteins, okay, carrier proteins. And that's the key to this because when it gets to, when it got to a certain threshold or when all the carrier proteins were um, used up, they couldn't transport any more stuff, okay? And that's how you differentiate between passive and facilitated. This one has a carrier protein. They're telling me that when it got to a certain point, all these guys were used up and they could only send so much through at a time and so it kind of leveled off, okay? So which of these is your answer? It's gonna be a facilitated diffusion. Simple and passive are the same. Active transport uses, um, uh, you know, uses energy and then of course I just do that in that last one for more of a distractor, okay? But you got to know the basics of that. You, you have to know the, the, the types of absorption, passive, facilitated, active transport, and the cytosis. You can differentiate them by which ones use energy. And then between them, you can kind of figure out, um, you know, especially between these two, that one that used to carry your protein. All right. And this one. The difference between the above curves can best be explained by which of the following. And this is just one of those... Uh, you know, just your basic X and, X and Y axis, concentration of the solutes. Um, the rate of transport is what the Y axis says. It's just a poor copy. Um, so you see how one comes up, one of these goes up, and then it eventually levels off. And then one of them goes in a straight line. Now just by looking at that, which of the, you know, what would you say these, these two really are? Well, I would say this one, it's like a line like this, it seems like things just keep going across, keep going across, keep going across based on the concentration. So when I look at that, I'm thinking, okay, this one's got to be passive um, or simple diffusion. This one kind of goes up to a certain point and then the rate of transport levels off, which probably means what? That, that, that the carrier proteins got saturated. So this is probably a facilitated diffusion. So based on that, the difference between the above curves can best be explained by which of the following, membrane thickness, protein carrier, amount of ATP made available, or area across the membrane. Now everything looks good, but a lot of smoke and mirrors on this, right? What's the difference is that this one doesn't have any carrier proteins. It's all passive diffusion. This one had carrier proteins that got saturated. So what's the difference between the two? The protein carrier, okay? Now, step one, they're, they're really big into you interpreting graphs and understanding the mechanism behind it, but this is a good example that I've seen that can uh, best explain that concept. So, hope this was helpful, guys.